अहं भन्ते ईश्वरनेन सह पंच शीलानि याचामि तुतियंते अहं भन्ते ईश्वरनेन सह पंच शीलानि याचामि तत्यंते अहं भन्ते ईश्वरनेन सह पंच शीलानि याचामि नमो तस्य भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धस नमो तस भगवत अर्हत सम्मास 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 नमो तस भगवतो अर्हतो सम्मासंबुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदसुदस
that is why it is called patimoka. Restraint is restraining. This is a term for bodily and verbal non-transgression. The patimoka itself is as restraint is patimoka restraint. Restrained with the patimoka restraint is restrained by means of the restraint consisting in that patimoka. He has it, possesses it, is the meaning. Where all bears himself in one of the postures. So this is um, a start of the description uh, or the exposition on these four types of uh, virtue, starting on the fourth tetrad, 42, so starting in the last paragraph. So in the last paragraph, there was a brief explanation of the fourfold virtue which is again the bulk of this chapter it's where he's going to spend i think the most amount of time uh, and so what we have here is each of if you look at 42 each a b c and d this was and th this was an explanation of a and this is a commentarial explanation explanation so you're getting an example of how the commentaries are structured a commentary will be structured in this way of just picking apart the paragraph word by word. So if you look at 43, 43 here, so it starts with the word here, right? From 42, the virtue described by the Blessed One does here, and then it's going to, the next word is bhikkhu. What is a bhikkhu? Explain the bhikkhu. Patimoka, or restraint with the patimoka restraint. So in the italics, um, in the text I've got anyway, the thing in italics is actually from the earlier paragraph. So the, a commentary would take a, a piece, a word or a phrase from the original text and then explain it out. And that's what's going on here all the way down to dwell is the last word it explains. It, wouldn't, it doesn't explain every word, but it explains the words that it thinks need explaining. Number 44, the meaning of possessed of the proper conduct and resort, etc., should be understood in the way in which it is given in the text. For this is said, possessed of the proper conduct and resort, there is proper conduct and improper conduct. Herein, what is improper conduct? Bodily transgression, verbal transgression, bodily and verbal transgression. This is called improper conduct. Also, all unvirtuousness is improper conduct. Here, someone makes a livelihood by gifts of bamboos, or by gifts of leaves, or by gifts of flowers, fruits, bathing powder, and tooth sticks, or by flattery, or by bean soupery, or by fondling, or by going on errands on foot, or by one or the other of sorts of wrong livelihood condemned by the Buddhas. This is called improper conduct. Herein, what is proper conduct? Bodily non-transgression, verbal non-transgression, bodily and verbal non-transgression. This is called proper conduct. Also, all restraint through virtue is proper conduct. Here, someone does not make a livelihood by gifts of bamboos, or by gifts of leaves, or by gifts of flowers, fruits, bathing powder, and toothsticks, or by flattery, or by bean soupery, or by fondling, or by going on errands on foot or by one or the other of sorts of wrong livelihood condemned by the Buddhas. This is called proper conduct. So here this is, um, it's interesting how it gets into livelihood. Am I, is this not still A? Still A, right? Yes. And then B. Okay, so I think in in whatever C is it, uh, he's going to get into more detail about some of these wrong livelihoods. But um, uh, yeah, well, anyway, I'll, I'll just briefly say that this the, these forms of livelihood, even though they, they may not sound like livelihood, but they're they're ways of monks of of ingratiating themselves with lay people. So it's actually a problem sometimes where monks will provide some service for lay people and then the, the lay people feel obligated to support them or or maybe even become deluded into thinking that the monk is giving them something special like maybe some magical charm or something and they will um, give 
give great support to that look. And this is wrong livelihood, of course, because it leads the monk down the wrong path and it leads lay people down the wrong path. It just takes the focus off of what's important. And it's associated with greed and delusion. So. But these are monastic livelihood issues. And the pati moka is the rules of, for monks, so you can understand it by extension to mean rules and uh, you know, acts that are eth uh, unethical, or the abstention from acts that are unethical, along with the performance of acts that are you know, ethical, like it's, it's right or righteous, you, something you should do, like help someone when they are call an ambulance when someone gets hit by a car or something. I'm even in Ger the German translation. I'm uh, confused about the term and what what does being supreme mean, Bante? Do you know that? I think he's going to explain it in the part on livelihood. No. So let's wait until that. If he doesn't, then I'll go into it. Okay, thank you. Forty-five. Proper resort. There is proper resort and improper resort. Herein, what is improper resort? Here someone has prostitutes as resort, or he has widows, old maids, eunuchs, bikunis, or taverns as resort, or he dwells associated with kings, king's ministers, sectarians, sectarians' disciples, in becoming association with laymen, or he cultivates, frequents, honors such families as are faithless, untrusting, abusive and rude, who wish harm, wish ill, wish woe, wish no sources of bondage for bhikkhunis and bi for bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, for male and female devotees. This is called improper resort. Here, what is proper resort? Here, someone does not have prostitutes as resort or taverns as resort. He does not dwell associated with kings, sectarians, disciples, an unbecoming association with laymen. He cultivates, frequents, honors such families as are faithful and trusting, who are solace, where the yellow cloth glows, where the breeze of sages blows, who wish good, wish well, wish joy, wish sources of bondage, for bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, for male and female devotees. This is called proper resort. Thus, he is furnished with, fully furnished with, provided with, fully provided with, supplied with, possessed of, endowed with this proper conduct and this proper resort. Hence, it is says, it is said, possessed of the proper conduct and resort. Forty-six. Furthermore, proper conduct and resort should be should also be understood here in the following way. For improper conduct is twofold, as bodily and verbal. Herein, what is bodily improper conduct? Here, someone acts disrespectfully before the community, and he stands jostling elder bhikkhus, sits jostling them, stands in front of them, sits in front of them, sits on a high seat, sits with his head covered, talks standing up, talks waving his arms, walks with sandals, while elder bhikkhus walk without sandals, walks on a high walk while they walk on a low walk, walks on a, on a walk while they walk on the ground, stands pushing elder bhikkhus, sits pushing them, prevents new bhikkhus from getting a seat, and in the bathhouse, Without asking elder bhikkhus, he puts wood on the stove, holds the door, and in the bathing place, he enters the water, jostling elder bhikkhus, enters it in front of them, bathes jostling them, bathes in front of them, comes out jostling them, comes out in front of them, and entering inside a house, he goes jostling elder bhikkhus, goes in front of them, pushing forward he goes in front of them, and where families have inner private
green rooms in which women of the family, the girls of the family sit. There he enters abruptly and he strokes a child's head. This is called bodily improper conduct. I have a, a question about that passage. When, when it mentions the, um, the, the talking while, while waving arms, I, I was just curious as to why, the, does that mean like how some people will um, so, sort of like talk with their hands or they'll, you know, like move, move their hands in certain ways to sort of punctuate their sentences? Is, is that what, it, what it's referring to in, in that sentence? Oh well, yeah, except arms is a little bit like it's a little bit more emphatic. Like moving your hands is one thing. Mm-hmm. Moving your arms is excessive. Okay, like very, very dramatic movements. Right. And and what? Yeah, and so so why is that a um a, a n- not a good thing to have the you know dramatic emphasis i mean i i guess you know it's a little bit may, maybe uh, unusual in the case of a bhikkhu but I, i'm just curious if there's a deeper meaning well it's a sign of unmindfulness if you're that emphatic you're not really equanimous most likely it doesn't look uh, it gives people the wrong idea if if people get excited about or get, get um feel uh, a, an approval of that sort of activity then they're going to get excited and it, it encourages people to be to get excited about things and so yeah it encourages yeah. defilement kind of thing oh. really should I mean a monk is an example but meditators as well can be subdued restrained mindful in all their movements so if you're going to move your hands at all you should be mindful of it, and waving your arms is, or you could do it mindfully, of course, but <laughs> people don't do it because they're mindful, they generally do it because they're unmindful. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a, a, a really interesting uh, way, way to look at it, and especially to what you said at the very end, Bonte, about, you know, it's it's generally a sign of unmindfulness, but, so, you know, some, in theory, you could do the movements and be mindful about them. The The reason it, it stuck out as so interesting is I used to work in sales and we had this whole theory about, you know, certain body language and movements with your hands and arms to, to emphasize certain words while you're doing a sales presentation, how it communicates and affects the other person. And, you know, to, to a degree, you have to be sort of mindful of where your where your body and hands and and so forth are are at in that situation. So it's it, it's it's kind of an interesting perspective to think about wh- where what your body and hands are doing while you're talking, but not necessarily trying to do anything with them and just trying to be still. So I I like that. I think this is more relevant uh, in the case of. Uh junior monk uh, speaking with a senior monk, right? So if you are like waving your arms and doing such bodily actions, it's a sign of disrespect towards the senior monk. So... No, I'm not sure if that's You are that's teaching the senior monk something? No, I, I, no I, I think this is not... I think these three things that this is what had covered it's disrespectful shirt, talk standing up, talk slaving arms. Yeah, yeah well, it may, maybe, I, but I don't think so. I think, um, in fact, these are um, things that are mentioned, right? He quotes the Nidana, Nidesa, Nidesa. Yeah, talk standing up is an interesting one. Certainly talk standing up isn't is out of context it's not always a bad thing so you're you're, you're i think you're right in in pointing out there is context here in context uh so when you're amongst when you're amongst the monks you should shouldn't sit up stand above them and talk above them and that sort of thing. so there's a good point maybe you're right 
But I don't think there's a case where you should be waving your arms as a monk or as a meditator even. Unless there's some emergency. And related to because uh, with uh, this, I mean, I know what an elder is in in the sense of the of a of a bhikkhu. Can this be translated to the lay world to being respectful to the elders, to older people, basically? That's what I'm asking. It can be, yeah, though it kind of differs from culture to culture, right? Um, I would say it more directly relates to how lay people treat monks. So in, in Buddhist circles, it's kind of lay people treat monks as their, as their, as their elders. And that's when you would uh, consider these things or like give the monk a higher state and so mm-hmm. Also, Bhante, these uh, words, Chartu Kamata, Ukasupata, these are explained in the Sinhalese uh, edition I have. I don't see them in the English version. Are they coming up? Which one? Virtue regarding. Verbal actions. So you are uh, in the right, uh, wrong livelihood. You uh, you say something uh, that uh, lay people like to hear, so you can gain the next, the next paragraph, I think. Herein, what is verbal improper conduct? Here, someone acts disrespectfully before the community, without asking elder bhikkhus. He talks on the dhamma answers questions, recites the Paddy Mocha, talks standing up, talks waving his arms. Having entered inside a house, he speaks to women or a girl thus, you so-and-so of such-and-such a clan, what is there? Is there rice gruel? Is there cooked rice? Is there any hard food to eat? What shall we drink? What hard food shall we eat? What soft food shall we eat? Or what will you give me? He chatters like this. This is called verbal improper conduct. I mean, in the context, these are just examples of improper conduct, both bodily and verbal. So, so how you can extrapolate this is to any verbal activities or or, or physical or bodily activities that are disrespectful, but also. Uh, disruptive and uh, manipulative based on greed based on anger so when you're so for example what you see in in airports airports are an interesting study watching people clamor for the first uh, first spot in the lineup to get on the plane it, it used to be um, kind of ridiculous because we're going to be spending hours on the plane anyway. Why are you in such a hurry? But lately it's gotten kind of vicious because, or, or competitive anyway, because there's limited uh, carry on on the plane. And so uh, you can watch people kind of jostling. Not, not really, but I've been in some airports. It depends which part of the world. Some airports don't have a good organization. And then everyone, like, 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 cow, like cattle trying to get out of the pen, just rush for the gate. So that's, that would be considered where there's jostling in the lineup, uh, or pushing people, or cutting ahead in line. Sometimes you see that. On my flight here, we cut ahead in line unknowingly. But uh, we got in the wrong line, and then we got ahead and didn't realize that we were ahead. But sometimes people do that to try and cut ahead or to... to Get an advantage on someone else, pushing pushing people out of the way. That sort of thing. That's what this is talking about. For monks, of course, it's much more refined. We, we just when we walk in in the village, we are not even supposed to look around. We have to keep our eyes lowered to the ground. We have to keep our voice lowered. We've got lots of, we're, we're supposed to be very subdued and very focused. But by extrapolation, it refers to for lay people to physical and verbal conduct of all kinds. Forty-eight. 
proper conduct should be understood in the opposite sense to that. Furthermore, a bhikkhu is respe respectful, differential, possessed of conscience and shame, wears his inner robe properly, wears his upper robe properly. His manner is, inspires confidence whether in moving forwards or backwards, looking ahead or aside, bending or stretching. His eyes are downcast. He has a good deportment. He guards the doors of his sense faculties, knows the right measure in eating, is devoted to wakefulness, possesses mindfulness and full awareness, wants little, is contented, is strenuous, is a careful observer of good behavior, and treats the teachers with great respect. This is called proper conduct. This Firstly, is how proper conduct should be understood. What does it mean? Is a careful observer of good behavior? Well, usually that means they're just careful to to observe. Here doesn't mean watch. Observe here means to follow. Observance. It's a, an old word that we use to mean keeping or maintaining. Or following. Like you observe the rules means you keep the rules. I don't know why we use the word observe, but we do. 49. Proper resort is of three kinds. Proper resort as support. Proper resort as guarding. And proper resort as anchoring. Herein, what is proper resort as support? A good friend who exhibits the instances of talk in whose presence one hears what has not been heard, corrects what has been heard, gets rid of doubt, rectifies one, one's view, and gains confidence. Or by training under whom one grows in faith, virtue, learning, generosity, and understanding. This is called proper resort as support. What is meant by the word resort in in this passage? Is that the the same meaning as as previously when I was talking about the the improper resort? And yes. It, it, okay. Yeah. It, it it sounds almost like it's a, a slightly different uh, context here, though, since the the first time was like. Uh, about uh, donors and lay supporters, at, at least from what I gathered, and this is kind of more like um, like a per personal associates, not necessarily uh, supporters. It sounds like it is is that a is that correct? No, I mean maybe we do improper resort again, but it's like prostitutes and right. tavern it, kings. Okay. Maybe I'm just misunderstanding the use of the word resort. Does it mean like where where you go for support or uh, some something else in this case? Um, actually, the word is pasture. So where mm -hmm. you hang out. Oh, okay, okay. That that makes more sense now. I I was I was th thinking about it a, a little bit <laughs> a little bit different. Okay, I I, I think I understand now. Thank thank you, Monte. What is proper resort as guarding? Here, a bhikkhu, having entered inside a house, having gone into a street, goes with downcast eyes, seeing the length of a plow yoke, restrained, not looking at an elephant, not looking at a horse, a carriage, a pedestrian, a woman, a man, not looking up, not looking down, not staring this way and that. This is called proper resort as guarding. So, so the one thing about pastures is they have fences. You know, so one one quality of a pasture is the the boundaries. So this is a pasture because one limits oneself to this, or one restrains oneself in this way. That's how you understand this one is also a pasture. Guarding your senses is a pasture, in the sense that you stay within your bounds. You don't let your mind 
jump outside of the pasture. It's interesting it mentions uh, animals even or carriage. So nothing moving basically or what are you looking at? So not looking at an elephant, not looking at a horse, a carriage. Oh. Yeah, I mean, when you see an elephant, you don't look up and say, oh, an elephant, that's exciting. That's what it means. Or you see a horse, you say, oh, is that a, uh, a purebred horse? Oh, is that a beautiful horse? A woman, obviously, but also a man, men who are decked out in, in suits. Or Oh, is that a rich man or so on? The point is, you just don't, don't look at anything. And we'll see some stories, I I think maybe in this one, there's a story of a monk who, the only reason he knew the seasons change is because he saw the leaves and the flowers fall on the ground. Because he never looked up to the trees to see if they still had leaves and so on. One day some monks came to visit him. I, it's got to be in here somewhere. It's going to talk about it, so I'm kind of spoiling it. I won't spoil it. We will come, up, we will come to his story. That's a, a very very interesting passage too, because all all the the things is talking about you know restraining yourself from like you know don't don't look at the people the horses you know the the reason is uh, at least what I gather is that and then you start thinking about the people and conceptualizing and like you were saying oh is a rich man poor man etc all all those things are about beings and concept and not really you know a, anything important it's just let, letting the mind get caught up without without realizing it. Well, more importantly, there's it's it's a breeding ground for defilement. It's outside of your pasture because it's where you're going to get into trouble. Liking, disliking. If you look up at a woman, if a, a monk looks up at a woman, well, yeah, trouble. Uh, but mm. the same thing with. I mean, elephants and horses are kind of rare, and rich people have them, so they're exciting. Anytime anybody <laughs> sees a horse, even now, right? If you see a horse, you'd be excited. So it's, it's a breeding ground. and they, But they're just simple examples. Of course, if you see a, a billboard advertising, you know, no perfume or something. Yeah, yeah that, that's a, a good, uh, good good way of putting it. It, it, it reminds me of the, the question of Saka with the, the liking and the disliking and what causes the liking and disliking the uh, uh, elaborated notions of perception. I think the Pali was Papancha Sanya Sankara. Uh, and it, it it's, it's remi reminding me of that uh, um, passage from the Diga Nikaya a, a little bit right now. I was thinking maybe for nowadays for monks, uh... A horse would not ca catch their eyes, but a good car or a luxurious something car or a mot motorcycle would. Well, it's like if you are going from one place to another, uh, is it necessary for you to look at these things? No. We just have to be mindful of the way it, if you are walking, walking. If you are sitting in a car or something. Be mindful of that uh, posture. Good practice, even if you're not a monk, to catch yourself when you're excited looking at something, to try and be mindful of it. Try and keep your gaze lowered. I was doing that after I came back from Thailand because I read about it and I thought, oh, I'll try to do whatever the monks do. So I tried to be like a monk as much as I could. The excitement, like when we see something that excites us and you get that, that rush of excitement and, uh, you know, interest in whatever the object is, is that w what's generally meant when they talk about like lust being like a, a flood where it, it, it suddenly floods you, it, it you know, s sweeps you away almost and pull, pulls you into it like a, a, a river, you know, you get, you get so excited you lose focus on everything else. It clouds your judgment, you can't see clearly. Your mind is weak. Uh, the, the the term flooding, when they say uh, lust is a flood, is it is it related to that that sort of experience, or or is is that along the wrong lines? Not because it carries you away, drowns you in samsara. Mm. 
another example for lay people would be if you go for groceries, don't go around looking for things, just go for your stuff you need and then leave. We find it to be very productive and it's good to see uh, things like this being described. I mean, I, I always find benefit in the Bhikkhu's rules. 51. What is proper resort as anchoring? It is the four foundations of mindfulness on which the mind is anchored. For this is said by the blessed one. Bhikkhu's, uh, what is a Bhikkhu's resort? His own native place. It is these four foundations of mindfulness. This is called proper resort as anchoring. Being thus furnished with and though with this proper conduct and this proper resort, he is also on that account called one possessed of proper conduct and resort. I mean, I find it very interesting that, uh, I mean, we learned that uh, our noting practice will anchor us to the, our main object, right? And I'm seeing here in the commentaries this word that's actually for precisely the for the mindfulness practice. What are the four yeah. foundations of mindfulness? Well, you should read our booklet on how to meditate. That would be a good introduction to them. Okay, I probably could check it out. Thank you. Do you know what mindfulness is? Yeah, I do know I what know mindfulness is. Most, most, people, most people who say they know what it is don't know what it is. Uh, maybe read the booklet. Okay. And you can... Uh, it's like a good question. If you have that question, it's good that you say it. Because that's the sort of the doorway into this tradition that we practice. And, practice that we follow that leads to enlightenment. The Buddha said the four foundations of mindfulness are the straight path, the one-way path to Nibbana, freedom from suffering. Everything we do here is about the four foundations of mindfulness. It's a good reminder for everyone here, which is the basis of everything we do. Our practice is based around the four foundations of mindfulness. And we can see why, because here he's reminding us these are, this is our our anchor. I was just looking up the word anchor. Anu Upanibanda. Upanibanda. I just I just want to say that sometimes people are a little bit confused about the word foundations. And maybe that's what uh, Stephen was asking. But it's basically uh, the realities like what what is real is body feelings mind and dhammas so these are the four foundations yeah. foundation means what you use but to cultivate mindfulness mind yeah. the four parts of reality that are used that you that you cultivate mindfulness based on sort of patana or and is the the patana and satipatana is is that uh, the the same um, Pali word as patana like in, in the Abhidhamma like the, uh, the dependent conditions I think they sometimes translate it as or does it just sound kind of similar? Different word. Yeah, I don't think anchor is actually the right translation here. Well, I'm not familiar really with this word, but I think probably dependent on so you depend where we depend upon the four foundations. And what we depend upon, we rely upon them as a basis of our practice. So when, when in fact when you talk about kochara, it, it it really is the most deep meaning of the word is the four foundations of mindfulness. They are our gochara, our pasture. We should stay within the four foundations of mindfulness and stay within the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness, and that is your pasture. And w one more thing I'd like to ask a little bit of clarification on. Uh, j just a moment ago, um, the 
I, I, I'm not sure who it was that asked the question about the four foundations of mindfulness, but you asked them if they knew what mindfulness was. And I remember um, once in an old uh, video of yours, you, you said that oftentimes when people say mindfulness, uh, there's two different words they're using. Um, a lot of times they're referring to sati, the, the remembrance, but they really mean sampajana, the, the awareness. I was just curious if... Uh, in in this case, you're you're referring to the the sati when you say mindfulness, correct? Yes, that's what Thank he's you. referring to. That's what this okay. passage is referring to. Okay. Thank you. Good to do it. Seeing seeing fear in the slightest fault, one who has the habit sila of seeing fear in faults. Uh, of the minutest measure of such kinds as unintentional contra contravening of a minor training rule of the Patimokkha or the arising of unprofitable thoughts. He trains himself by undertaking samadaya, the precepts of training. Whatever there is among the precepts of training to be trained in, in all that he trains by taking it up rightly, sama adaya. And here, as far as the words one restrained by the patimokkha restraint, virtue of patimokkha restraint is shown by discourse in terms of persons. But all that beginning with the words possessed of proper conduct and re resort it should be understood as said in order to show the way of practice that perfects that virtue in him who practices it. Bhante, would you say that the Patamoka is the basis or the ground for the Bhikkhu Sangha? Because we always say Sila Samadhi Panya and it is basically Sila. No, the Patimokkha is not really the sila, not, not the sila that is most important. There's something called Adi Sila. Patimokkha is not really Adi Sila. I mean, of course, some of them are very important, but, but they're still not Adi Sila. Adi Sila more relates to, I mean, you can see what he's getting at here. He's always relating it back to mindfulness and restraint of the senses. So the next paragraph that we'll get to is getting into what's more related to Adisila. There's even a passage where the Buddha said, if you break some of the minor precepts, but you're still keeping Adisila, and Adisamadhi and Adipanya, then the Buddha considered it wasn't, you didn't consider it, it's not wrong. That Bhikkhu isn't at fault. And then he says, but the precepts have purpose. And even Arahans still try to keep all of them, or not try, but keep them, right? Yeah. But we didn't uh, answer the question. I don't know if it's still going to be an answer about the being supery. Could you maybe explain it in a short way? Um, I, honestly, I think being supery is not well explained. We'll have to see, but... Um, I think it actually just involves giving something small to encourage people to give give you something big in return. Like if you give a token, then people feel like uh, indebted to you. That's where a monk would give. I'm actually not sure enough. I just will have to wait for. It. Wait for a little explanation. But yeah, it's, um, I've just I've just searched for it. It's in chapter seventy. It's in paragraph seventy-five. Oh no, yeah, no, it's something actually quite different. They are explaining the the single is book out just immediately after the paragraph. So the yeah, no, I was totally. I can remember what it was. It's, it's, it will be explained. It's in paragraph seventy-five. Yeah, they're they're all explained. 
and it's quite an interesting interesting art that really gives you a well, for a monk it's quite interesting it shows us some things that we may not have even thought of very very detailed Monty, uh when you're when you're learning a new language do you have a particular way that you note it in your mind like you know hearing hearing thinking wondering you know tr trying to to note the mental process of of learning the language or is is language just something uh maybe a little complicated to to note in that way you can always be noting no matter what you're doing <laughs> and so uh when you do learn a, a language, what, what are you typically noting when trying to learn something new like that? With noting, you're just noting your, your the movements of the body, the frame of the mind. If you want to be mindful during learning, you can just say thinking and then continue learning. Or just anything else really you can make a pause and close your eyes and rising and falling. And just meditate. Just be mindful. There's, there are no rules. Rather, for things like that, you, you, know, you just have to be mindful uh, in between what you're doing. Some of those things you can be mindful. If you're driving a car, then we should more focus on the driving. And occasionally, when when you're when it's why you can note your posture, for example. Very good. I was just thinking, uh, while well, listening to your answers, just trying to, to note the thought process, the thinking, intending to ask, asking. And that's very, very, very good. Thank you. If these are the rules, how the bhikkhus should conduct themselves, even with... Uh... Like how they behave, and I mean, this is so easy to see that they are doing this or not, right? I I can't believe that they are all able to keep it this strictly, to have proper bodily conduct, verbal conduct, etc. Like that's and uh, if they transgress these these things, are it, are these like major rules or? Small rules or offenses. Whether of all sorts. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You can small. Thai monks, uh, Thailand, pretty common for monks to be able to keep sorts of things that we mentioned here. Usually it's only the foreign monks that uh, get really out of hand. Sometimes acting in ways that are just not really appropriate. Very rambunctious. Sometimes yelling, sometimes threatening. Sometimes just acting inappropriately. Are they um, for monks there? I mean, more than one or two? Sure. Are there foreigner? more foreign monks there? No. Foreigners, yes. Oh, well, there's two Chinese monks. No. So, yes, there are two foreign monks. So, there's three of us. So, Chris will be the fourth? Yeah. You will not have an easy time blending in, I think. <laughs> That's okay. They're kind of used to foreign monks coming and going here. And the practice will happen a lot. Yeah. Alupali was known as the monk who was the most pure in virtue, other than the Buddha. One of the eight great disciples. Ante, was there a similar substance back in the Buddha's time, like coffee? And I'm asking if he prohibited something like that. So not directly coffee, but it can be compared to that. I don't think so. 
I mean, what, what there was was there were intoxicants and drugs. Uh, I don't think, I think they're generally not looked highly upon. Coffee could be considered a narcotic. I, mean, I don't think you have to worry about it for breaking the five precepts, but I mean, that would be ridiculous, but still, it is a narcotic. And the effect that it has is along those lines. Yeah, because I would only feel coffee makes you feel good. It's very good for concentration, for example, if you have to. If I have, have to do something very important, like an, an exam, I think you mentioned that as an example one time. And I don't know if it's like cheating at, at some point. I don't know. Yeah. Not for meditation, really. Try to discourage meditators from really. here are drinking coffee. Try and discourage it. I think in general, I, I didn't mean to say that, you know, suggest that lay people shouldn't drink coffee or caffeine or something, but it's something to consider that um, for someone serious, I mean, I, I guess I would say someone doing an intensive meditation course, they really should give it up. I do know people, Buddhists, who have given it up and still go to work and they just realized that it was quite an addiction and so they trying to live without it. It's amazing how it's become something that I was thinking, whether, wondering whether it, it has had a big impact on on our our the nature of the world, like how much of an impact coffee and caffeine has had on this insatiable consumerism and drive for for the ambition and money and so on. I wonder if you could attribute a significant effect to coffee, to caffeine. Because you think, I mean, it's, it's something that, it's a drug that people, that I guess the majority of people involved in economic activity they take every day. Some people multiple times per day. I so can't if, if we didn't have that drug, if we didn't use that drug around the world, whether it be in coffee or tea, or these, uh, they have even these Red Bull drinks. Then, uh, how different would our society be? Maybe we'd have to be a little more laid back. We'd there'd be a little bit less of this insatiable greed, the drive, the ambition. The world is going faster and faster, and coffee is a big part of it. Probably. Yeah, I heard. I heard people drink that they are drinking it like multiple times, not once a day. Yeah, there, I mean, there's cultures where, like, look at Sri Lanka, it's a big part of the culture to have caffeinated tea throughout the day. But tea is a little bit uh, not as, as extreme as coffee, I find it. Because coffee has a much more... I think it's stronger, so it's a bit different. Yeah, it's uh, one of our main foreign revenue streams, selling tea, importing tea. I don't think it's got that, that much less caffeine. We should look at that. I think it, uh, the way it starts working is slower than coffee and tea. It goes slower than the amount of caffeine that goes in your blood or something like that. If we were to suggest to Sri Lankan people that they should stop drinking tea, that would be something. I guess it depends on the body type and the person because for me, the coffee or tea has no discernible effect. Like I can drink any amount of coffee or not drink, it doesn't matter to me. And it doesn't affect my sleep cycle. Like I can sleep with or without it anytime I want. It's like uh, I sleep, I understand. But I don't know. Maybe if you were a little more mindful, you could see that it does actually perk you up. People who say that, I'm not sure I believe them. I mean, I haven't been drinking coffee like uh, for months now. I don't even miss it. Same with. Oh, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think it's addictive like that. 
in my own way a little bit. It's, um, it, I think it affects the, it excites the body. It does. Uh, at least for me, if I take it and I do it very rarely, it, uh, the effect goes on the whole day and it, it has a negative impact on my practice, for example, restlessness and just, I wouldn't say unnatural states, but you wouldn't experience the same things or I wouldn't experience the same things if I didn't take coffee. But in a greedy way, I think it's making you feel good and yeah, promoting sensuality, greed. I think uh, to me, coffee is very addictive. I used to drink like five cups a day. I'm from Sweden. I've read the statistics. I think we're second in the world after Finland and uh, drink coffee all the time. And uh, now I, I don't drink so much anymore, maybe a couple of cups per week. Um, but uh, it's also been in relation to meditation, like it definitely makes it easier. It makes it more pleasurable <laughs> to meditate or something like that. So uh, uh, it's um, tempting to drink coffee and, and uh, you have that uh, energy factor that they talk about in the seven factors. <laughs> Of enlightenment, you can kind of cheat, you get in, you it's easier to concentrate and all that. At, at least, uh, I guess people are different, some people don't like it, but, but I try to stay away from it. It could be a similar kind of addiction people have to things like ice cream, like we uh, it, uh, that would be uh, something more difficult to give up than coffee. I also could make the connection was that I drink tea and coffee almost every day during winter break and also I think coffee and the tea they become part of our diet daily kind of food or eating system um I saw how they would you know impact my practice um for example if I drink too much coffee, I could kind of speak in a very harsh way or faster or the tone or the loud. Also, um, interesting, but it's also, I could, I could tell that my blood, you know, has those essentials in it and uh, they play, play a significant role in how I behave. Um, so that's why I needed to stop drinking them every other maybe three or six months to get get into the normal state. But it, I did see how it impacted my practice, not being mindful. Mm -hmm. What do you practice? Um, I practice, um, I started from uh, Vipassana Bhante. Right now I'm living in New York. I don't know if you know, Sir, you know the city of Syracuse. I know you were probably in Hamilton. It's very close to Buffalo, so maybe three away from Hamilton. So um, I practiced Vipassana in 2015. I went to the Gainka Center. So after that, I practiced a Zen dating meditation. Right now, I'm working on the mindfulness try to teach college students to be mindful that's why i asked the four foundations because um in different books they talked about the four foundations in different terms and the uh, terminology is different so um i found it challenging to teach college students to be mindful okay well again yeah read read our booklet maybe you'll find it helpful Oh, sure, I will do as so. We have lots of videos on YouTube and books as well. Bonte, do you mind if I ask you a question? You two questions. When will you be back in Canada? Because some of my, our friends we practice together, they know you um, from a long time ago uh, when you still at you know Hamilton through Facebook. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we want to visit you if possible if you are back to Canada. The second question is、um, how to be efficient to teach college students to be mindful if necessary. I don't know when I'll be back in Canada. I, there is、um, a Thai monk there who invited me to go and stay in his monastery near London, Ontario, which is farther than Hamilton, but still not so far. Um, so if I do go back, I probably would go and stay with him. But、uh, that would only happen if I can't find a place to stay here, because I think I maybe have more、uh, value and more profit to stay here. I mean, where I am now is the most profit. It's just whether or not they let me teach the way I teach here, because、uh, every day I'm teaching. Tomorrow there's Maybe thirty new students coming.、We'll、start with another group tomorrow, and we have students still here from before. So it'll be thirty or forty people, probably.、Um, second question: College students are not the best、um, target group, unfortunately.、Uh, I mean, you may get one or two of them out of out of a large group. Who actually can be serious about it and commit themselves, but everyone else is—they're too caught up in worldly things. They're caught up in their studies, but they're also just caught up in being young.、Um, they're caught up in their lives away from college. They're caught up in their extracurriculars at college. They're just not focused enough. What I did at college was I taught a five-minute meditation lesson. So I set up a booth, club booth. They had this club space, and where the club set up their booths, I set up a booth,、uh, and I put up a big sign that said "five free." I think it said "free, free, five-minute meditation lesson," and it was quite popular because that's about all they've got is five minutes. <laughs> that's all about. That's about all most people are willing to give is five minutes. And so, in five minutes, I taught them how to be mindful. It was quite popular. I assume it helped some people. Thank you, Bhante. Believe it or not, right now mindfulness is the kind of movement. You know, we try to integrate mindfulness in the courses、uh, to promote well-being on college campuses. So. But just as you said, maybe just one or two out of twenty or fifty students, they are very serious, be interested to continue on that path. But most of them are just prefer using cell phone, no matter what. <laughs> so that's、uh, kind of the problematic、yeah. to me. Try to get them attention. I think it's the wrong. I mean, I tried. I tried for some years to start up a Buddhism organization and. People are interested, but they don't have the focus, and they don't even have the focus for their classes. College students are pretty in a pretty bad state at the moment, what I can see.、Um, colleges are not looking so good. Thank you, Bonnie. Again, I think five minutes probably a good way just to plant a seed for them to maybe see the difference before and after. I think. Uh, being mindful could be helpful, also. <laughs> helpful, yeah. Yeah, what it is. It let us let us introduce people and let let us tell them about a more、uh, advanced group that we had. So we had once、uh, once a week, we had a group that would meet and meditate for, I think, an hour or a half an hour or something. And、so they could、uh, they could join that if they were interested, and there we would teach them walking and sitting. Yeah, I think I think just、um, making it too easy for people. I mean, that's just、uh, probably just in, in introduction. But、um, I mean, if it's too easy, people just don't appreciate it as much. I think. Yeah, college students are.、Uh... Usually,、uh, like twenty to thirty years old, so or maybe less. They're eighteen in college now. Or in the in the U.S., it's always been eighteen. Yeah. Okay. Eighteen to maybe. Ah.、Uh, okay. Twenty 
most 20 plus i guess yeah like uh, considered you hated with health intoxicated with you know not even dead death yet <laughs> happened in their family so i mean that there's just so many issues with that age as well like it's so rare for a uh, 18 year old like i mean delao is the only exception i know <laughs> maybe not the only one 18 also comes under the second decade which is uh, the creed the uh, playful decade yeah. so it's is also here i have no clue how old he is <laughs> But I also recently had a conversation with a friend I, I didn't see for a long time and I told him about how I got into Buddhism and how it just changed everything for me. And he was just so surprised that I didn't have a quote unquote quote big reason for this because most people think that they have to go through and something very bad like someone died close to them or they had an accident and they then they turned to re, a religion and changed their life. So it seems like it's very uncommon to not have this as a reason and background. So I think that's also yeah. something to consider. I mean, as far as I know, most of us are like that. <laughs> something really bad happened to us. I think it also depends on... Uh... Your upbringing, where you are like uh, brought up in a environment, uh, people value wisdom, then uh, you are naturally attracted to uh, such things. When are you going to come and do a course, Sanka? Soon. He's, uh, Austin says we are dragging him, dragging him. Sanka done the at home course? Uh, no, I haven't done no, the, not course with anyone. <laughs> he hasn't even done the at-home course. I don't know if your logic is really sound, so okay. <laughs> but I have done courses here in Sri Lanka. <laughs> yeah? What sort of courses? Yeah, and the uh, Mahasi Sayada tradition in Kandabodha and also in uh, Ratmal Kandabodha, the Mahasi Sayada tradition. Yeah, first time I stayed like... Uh, Two weeks, second time, but it's a long time ago. Not recently, probably not after getting married. Still, that's good. Yes, sad. Kendo Buddha, all I know is I went one day and they made me hurry up and eat. I was trying to eat one meal and they wouldn't let me. They, they said, you have to stop, you have to finish. Is it close to at a time limit. They had a time limit on how, how long they could eat, eat breakfast. Okay. I didn't know that. I went to the other Kandu Buddha and, and yeah, there are told, two places. And told Premis, I, I told Premis Siri that, that the other place uh, just wasn't for me or something like that. And the, the monk who was the head of the other place was sitting listening. <laughs> I didn't realize they were connected. And make a good impression when it was done. You, you should visit uh, Alabante. There's a nice uh, meditation center, and I think you can even uh, do a course there. There are a lot of students who would benefit from your teachings. The monk there is the other monk who, the, who who's a contemporary of uh, Pema Srihamdra. He was uh, like the head monk of Kandabuddha while Pema uh, Srihamdra's teacher was there. So now he left that place uh, and started a meditation center in Alla. There are a lot of foreign people coming there also. I think you uh, can stay in Thailand. Maybe I'll go stay in Sri Lanka. I got a dengue vaccine today. There's a new dengue vaccine. So I'm not afraid of Sri Lanka anymore. <laughs> and I yeah, guess that's going to kill me not as easily. <laughs> yeah, and there are no uh, no uh, cobras there in 
the place i'm recommending no no serpent uh, is it is it recommended to uh, have the vaccine uh, before going the, to thailand it is now uh now now yeah, i don't know they're saying it is but i did read something that if you haven't gotten dengue at least once that they weren't recommending the vaccine so but not everyone is oh, saying that okay. they're getting mixed mixed messages yeah if you haven't had it before it actually can make it worse but if you have had dengue at least once then it uh, makes it a lot better and survived it <laughs> survived it i may have had dengue more than once because the time i noticed having it it was pretty severe and apparently the first time you get it it's usually not that severe Okay. But maybe I got it more than once. All right. Well, that's all for me this week. Thank you for coming. Next week is uh, one hour early. 24th is a full moon day, right? Yeah. The 24th is my first chanting of the Pati Mokha. I am doing the reciting on the 24th. First time in oh. 15 years. Maybe maybe we can still come here and just uh, give a live uh, so live screen screen share together. sorry for those of us. I don't oh. think it's broadcast live. But, um, I don't even think lay people watch it. I'll ask. I will ask because maybe Chris or Austin can live stream it or something. There's a big ordination happening here on the 1st of April, it looks like. So maybe that's when Chris will ordain. Okay, have a good week, everyone. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Edit, and all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, this.